Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe below for more ghoulish tales. Well, well, well. Welcome back to the Dark Forest, everyone. I hope you brought your flashlights, because if not, you may want to stay a little closer to the fire. Once again, I brought some boys and ghouls around the campfire to share their scary stories alongside me. It's gonna be a long night. Well, without further ado, let's get spooky. This happened to me and my family last summer. We were spending the weekend up in Yosemite National Park up in Northern California. I've been there before, but only a couple of times when I was a kid with my mom when I was real young. This is the first time I actually went out there to go camping with my now family. Of course, the last time I was there, I think I was around 8 or 10 years old. So going there again was almost like a brand new experience even for myself. It was just myself, my wife, and my son. It wasn't no big party or anything, but we all enjoy camping, especially myself. My wife actually never went camping before until she started dating me, so I am super jazzed that she actually enjoyed it. When we first arrived, it was absolutely breathtaking, as I remember as a kid. But then again, I was young, so it's not like I could remember everything. I really just remembered, like, certain situations... Like that time my mom bought a whole bunch of foos gold and put it all over our camping section and just sat there and drank with my stepdad and just laughed as I thought we struck rich and was collecting all the gold. Look, mom, we're rich. And then some neighboring child coming over saying, oh, I could help. And I was like, no, this is my section. Go find your own gold. And then later on, my mom took me to the souvenir shop and I gave all the gold back and the cashier gave me $5. Now as an adult, my mom telling me the real story she paid that lady to do that for me. It was cute. So I plan to do that with my son this time. And now that I'm reminiscing, I also recall that a bear had broken into the vehicle of our neighbors that night. But I'm not trying to scare you off. Just yet. Anyways, I had reserved our camping weekend at least six months in advance if I can remember correctly. It's a very desired place. It's absolutely gorgeous in every way, and it has multiple waterfalls like everywhere you look. It's gorgeous. Once we checked in, got the map, and finally figured out where our spot was after about 30 minutes, we finally started to set everything up, which included the chairs, the ice chest, the tent itself, our things, brick chargers for our phones, Bluetooth speakers so we could jam, charcoal and some wood that we bought, and so on. After we had finished setting everything up, we had a late lunch. It consisted of hot dogs and hamburgers, and plenty of chips to go around. I tossed back a couple beers while my wife had some water and my son had a Dr. Pepper. After we finished eating, we decided we should go on one of the hikes that is nearby our spot, just because... And then, once we get back, I'm sure that we would have earned a whopping hunger for dinner around the fire. Fast forward a couple of hours. We were trying to wrap up the hike as we were already on our way back to our spot. I couldn't ask for a better day. The weather was absolutely gorgeous. I happened to come across some weird-looking tracks on the way back in some mudded areas along the trail. I'm no expert... But I spent the good half of the beginning years in the Boy Scouts. At first, I thought they belonged to some coyotes or maybe a large wolf. But I was wrong. Terribly wrong. Upon closer examination, I noticed how large these tracks were. Larger than anything I have ever seen before. But it was definitely canine. It had a large wide heel with four toes with the points above them from the nails. But these were... These were different. These tracks that I found were at least twice the size of my hand, and I have a big hand. I'm six foot two. It had the same layout as a wolf track, but much, much larger. My family asked me why I looked so puzzled when I was kneeling down in the mud. 
I tried to explain to them that this is something I've never seen, but it's much, much too large to be anything that I've ever encountered or read about or seen before. I didn't want to spook them, so I told them it's really nothing to worry about. Probably just an extra jumbo daddy out there somewhere, and I laughed it off, and we continued to walk back towards our spot. The sun was setting by the time that we had arrived. I informed everybody it's time to get dinner on, and then we could tell some scary stories around the fire. I had a full rack of baby back ribs that had been marinating with some sweet baby raised barbecue sauce for the past 24 hours. It was a fantastic feast, I'll tell you that much. While I was telling some ghost stories with my wife and son, I swore to the right of me behind my son's head in the distance in the woods, I thought I saw something looking back at us. It was in the corner of my eye and I was in the middle of this really spooky tale about some paranormal insane asylum or something. But I swear those eyes were glowing. I brushed it off, as it was kind of hard to tell anyways. It was pretty dark, and it seemed like it was kind of far away. But whatever it was, was definitely scoping us out. But like I said, I didn't really pay it any mind. I'm guessing around 11 o'clock we all decided it was time for bed and got inside of our tent with our sleeping bags and blankets. Sometime in the middle of the night, I had to pee. I didn't want to wake anybody else up, so I slowly got up and tried to exit the tent. But right before I grabbed that zipper is when I heard and felt the vibrations in the ground nearby. They were footsteps. Footsteps of something incredibly large. I've never felt anything like this before in my entire life. I had to see. I had to get a glimpse of what was out there. The curiosity was killing me. I leaned down on my knees and elbows and slowly opened the side of the zipper slowly. I want to say I opened the zipper about six to seven inches. I used my right pointer finger to spread open the zipper just enough for me to peek outside. What I saw has been haunting me ever since. There was this huge, furry man beast that stood up like a man. It was hunched over, prancing around our area, investigating its surroundings on our spot. This thing had pitch black fur, extra long arms, and its claws were incredibly freakish looking. Its snout was long, like a dog, but it wasn't fully a dog. God, I have no idea what it was. Its eyes glowed an amber color, I swear. I've... I almost pissed myself. The appearance of this thing thing and the way it sounded when it was grunting was purely abnormal, unknown, and incredibly horrifying. <laughs> Somehow, I gathered the courage to grab my air horn from my backpack that luckily was beside me so I didn't make any noise. I aimed it at the zipper, and I pressed the button. Not only did I wake the hell out of my family, probably scared them to death, but it scared the shit out of whatever that thing was outside, too. I saw it just lift its head up and freak the hell out and dart into the woods as quickly as possible on its back legs. Thank God I had that air horn, or else next, it may have made its way to our tent. Needless to say... I explained everything to my family as best as possible. We gathered our things as quickly as we could. We got in my car, and we left that night. I know our neighbors were pretty pissed off about the noise. I explained everything to them, but of course they didn't believe me. But you know what? I don't really give a crap. We were getting the hell out of there. 
We haven't been back to Yosemite since. Good evening, everyone. This is Tales to Chill. Tonight I bring you a tale regarding the most fabled cryptid, Mothman. I hope you please do enjoy. Um, if you're new, please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. There'll be more stuff coming this way. Thanks again, and I hope you enjoy. Three years ago, one of the biggest fads on television was the ghost hunting shows. Simple enough documentary-style programs that showed a team of people going out to some haunted locations and trying to debunk the happenings, Scooby-Doo style. They always kept to a hand-cam visual style, with some eerie ambient music overlaying the quiet bits or just filling in the background. Well, one thing that I and my friends, Eric, Ursula, and Kevin realized was that this style of show was very easy to replicate. So in the summer of 2011, the four of us decided that it might be fun to try making one. Maybe send it off to the sci-fi channel, or something if we caught anything. But what we lacked was equipment and a location. Eric's family was rather loaded, so he promised me, since it had been my idea, that he could get his hands on some voice recorders and video cameras if the rest of us found a place. Well, it only took one Google search to see that that went through too. There isn't much in the small town of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where we lived at at the time, and a quick look for haunted locations kept coming up with one place that would be free to use. A small park tucked away along a short road and nestled in between some dense forest and a local graveyard. Colonial Park, it was called. And much to my surprise, it had an interesting history of disappearances, strange events, and sightings. It had even been the progenitor of a creepy pasta or two. One thing, however, that came up in all the stories about this place was about a mysterious bat creature. A demon along the lines of the Jersey Devil, or Mothman, apparently, with a large humanoid body, massive wingspan, dark red eyes, and sharp claws. It had been connected to several disappearances, and is always the case with these monster stories. The page itself was littered with horribly photoshopped pictures, 3D renderings, and artist depictions of this thing. Regardless, we knew we wanted to hit this place up. We figured, what was the harm? We show up at night, get some video footage of us calling out into the night, maybe find some mysterious animal bones that we'd planted ourselves, of course, and go home. Well, the following is a copy of the video transcript put together by police several days later. With luck, it will convince people to stay away from that place. I should also note that I've changed our names in this piece simply to protect us and our families. The video begins with a sudden flash as the device's record button was hit, showing the four teens in a small vehicle on their way to the park. The timestamp in the corner reads, 10.24 p.m. Hey, that thing running? A male with glasses. Jack. Asked leaning over in the front seat to look back at the camera holder. The camera shakes in reply as the voice of Ursula is heard. Yup, ready to find ourselves a monster. From the driver's seat, a blonde boy with glasses. Eric. Looks back and grins. Zoinks, gang. We're like going to find a g -g ghost. The group laughs at the reference and the car pulls into a small lot. The camera looking through the car's window at the Colonial Park sign. Well, we're here. At this point, the four get quiet, looking nervous as they slowly exit the car. The camera pans around across the three males in the group, 
starting with Eric, who was a lanky and tall person, with shaggy, blonde hair and small glasses. He is wearing a green jacket with a white shirt underneath and blue jeans. Next, it moved to Jack, who is broader across than the shoulders, with thick combed brown hair and a local school sweater on. Lastly, it moved to Kevin, who has a look of distress on his face already, as he glances nervously at the nearby tree line. He's a bit taller than the others, but built like Eric, thin and narrow. He wears a heavy winter coat, zipped up to the neck. Together, the trio's attire marks the weather as cold, which fits with the timeline of events, as the suspect claimed it happened on November the 5th. What's wrong, Kev? Ursula voice asks snapping the tall boy from his distant staring long enough to look at the camera and stammer that nothing's wrong. At this point, Jack leans back into the vehicle and produces four flashlights, laying them on the car, before going back in and pulling out a second video camera and some bright pink duct tape. He gives the camera an incredulous look, holding up the tape with as if to ask, if Ursula was serious about the item. Her giggle was the only given reply. Jack can be seen taping a flashlight onto the side of the other camera, just as the video feed cuts out. The timestamp last reads 10.34 p.m. At 11.01 p.m., the camera resumes. All three males are visible and lined up with Jack in the corner. He explains where they are, and what is going to happen in the video, stating that he and Ursula will be going in one direction, while Kevin and Eric will be going the other. Eric is holding the second camcorder, lifting it and pressing a button to apparently show himself, starting its recording. As Jack continues speaking, a sudden screech is heard over the camera's audio, with Ursula stepping back from them and the three boys. Startled, either duck or look around for the source of the sound. Just as suddenly, a lone bat swoops into view before flying off into the trees, eliciting a laugh from the group. Looks like the bat creature's already got its sights on us, Eric joked. A now very nervous Kevin, glancing over at him and muttering that he shouldn't joke about that. With explanations over with, the group paired up and headed off in separate directions. Jack and Ursula make their way onto a small trail, leading back into the trees, with the camera ever so often shifting around to look back behind them and show the steadily receding parking lot. Though there is no reaction to it, on the pan back to see what was in front of them, the flashlight does appear to pass over something large in the trees. However, it was too indistinct to make out. The recording continues for nearly 30 minutes without incident. The two teens talking and making small jokes, while Jack calls into the woods and asks questions to an audio recorder he produced from his pocket. The only light visible for much of this time is that of the flashlight. However, the camera audio has something of note. You can distinctly hear the footsteps of the teens, but there is the occasional crunch of leaves or snapping branches in the distance, somewhere off to the right. Since neither of them react, however, it's difficult to tell if it's of any importance. At 11.47 p.m., Ursula stops walking and pans the camera around to the side of her, Jack stopping to regard her. Hey! What's wrong, he asked, clearly not bothered by the pitch-dark night. It's nothing, I guess, she replies. Her light then falls on a small burnt-out concrete structure, an old wellhouse as investigators have since reported. Look there, she says, her hand coming into frame long enough to point at the building and draw Jack's eyes. Some kind of old building. Should we check it out? Jack nods, 
and begins to move off the path towards the old structure, remarking, Hey, why not? Places like that work for those Hornet guys, right? It is unclear what he meant by this statement. Ursula does not show a reaction either, simply following in silence with her camera fanning out on both sides. According to reports after the fact, Ursula claimed that by this point, she had a feeling that they weren't alone out in the forest, and that she had hoped to catch Kevin or Eric following them as some kind of prank. As the pair reach the old worn-out building, Jack indicates that he is going to circle it, and for Ursula to stay put. She objects, but with a word of assurance, he disappears into the shadows, alongside of the well house. The camera continues its nervous panning, passing over another nondescript form in the trees. At this point, the camera seems to malfunction as the screen became flooded with red static and the audio a loud garbled mess. The last visible timestamp was 12.03 a.m. The timestamp upon the camera's return is 12.10 a.m. When the video returns to normal, the camera is laying in the leaves with the voices of Jack and Ursula sounding behind it. Ursula says, Hey, it's okay, what happened? Jack spoke up, Ursula's voice coming across as a mixture of whimpering and audible sobbing. The reasoning for this is yet unknown. However, she is heard saying, It came right at me. Jack, it ran for me. Footsteps are heard approaching the camera as she begs to leave the forest and to give up the whole endeavor. The camera rises undoubtedly having been picked up by Jack as Ursula's voice sounds far off still. As the camera turns, it settles on Ursula, sitting in on the forest floor with her back to a tall tree, her face panicked and blue eyes wide. Jack turns from her for a moment to look over the building once more before he speaks. All right, Ursula. I don't know what happened, but we'll go. I'm sure between what we have and what Kev got, we will. His voice is cut off by a distant scream. It sounds decidedly male, but it's impossible to tell with any certainty. As silence falls over the pair, it's important to note that any crickets, insects, animals, or other sounds one would typically hear in the woods have gone quiet as well. Jack's hand comes into frame to offer his hand to Ursula, who takes it gladly. Shit, Ursula. Your hands are like ice. Jack mumbled. The pair began to head back towards the path, but found themselves unable to locate in the dark. The two's conversation quickly begins to devolve into a series of harsh whispers as they argue over which direction they had come from to start with. A rustling can be heard off to the right, which sounds like a series of deliberate footsteps. Ursula yelps at the sudden sound and Jack turns the camera to face it, catching only what appears to be a shadow moving with his light. Jack gives a gasp as the camera moves to something. He appeared to have noticed for the first time the light from the camera falling on a torn green jacket hanging on the brush. While it is unclear if this was Eric's jacket, the sight is enough for Ursula to begin sobbing. Jack, still skeptical of what seems to be occurring around them, approaching the jacket and calling out to the other two. At this point, he doesn't seem to be paying attention to the camera as it swung around with his arm movements. Come on guys, this isn't funny anymore. You've got Ursula crying, so just come out and let's go. No answer is heard, however, as the camera swoops around with his arm. It passes again over a pair of red light sources in the trees, the source seeming to be the same black mass as caught before. The camera promptly cut to the red static, but only until for a moment 
as the timestamp does not change in the sweep. This tells me one thing, that the static seems to be occurring in real time, meaning there is no glitch with the device's clock. However, the presence of the shadow at each static burst is interesting. Spitting a curse, the pair finally manage to pick a direction and begin on their way through the dense forest. For the entire rest of the video, from 12.33 a.m. to 1.52 a.m., the pair is largely silent. The sounds of their footsteps and the trailing sounds from earlier filling most of the void. Jack uses the camera light as a guide to watch the ground, wary of roots or other hazards. The few times he does move the camera around, the red dots and shadows form again. Though they are farther into the trees than before, it's worth noting that whatever these lights are seem to always be facing the pair, like eyes in the dark, possibly an animal. At 1.53 a.m., the pair spot the eyes once more at the edge of the forest, where the fluorescent lights of the city can now be seen. This affords us one clear look at the thing before the red static erupts over the camera for the last time. The creature stood roughly seven feet, according to the analysis of the frame in which it was visible, with deep blood red eyes, indicating that this is what had been seen in the dark of the forest. Large bat wings coiled around it, making its body impossible to see. Its head was also unusual, as it seemed. Large, almost round-like, that of an owl, with a flat face whose only features were indeed those eyes. The static consumed the footage for all but the last minute or so of the recording, where we see Jack's face near the camera, laying passed out in the parking lot of the park. This is where police found him the next morning after being reported missing by his parents. The final timestamp was 2.58 a.m. The police, after hearing my story, did a sweep of the woods at Colonial Park. They were able to locate the torn jacket from the night before, but nothing else. Kevin, Ursula, and Eric were never found, and neither was the camera or voice recorder Eric had taken with him. The police held me for several days, trying to figure out if I was lying, or if I had somehow hurt my friends, but of course, they found nothing. As for me, all I remember from the last hour or so was seeing that thing standing there, seeing it run towards Ursula and I, and me pushing Ursula back behind me as it did. Everything else was just a blur, and I'm still not sure how I got from there to the parking lot in under an hour. None of it makes sense, but I know I must go back. That red-eyed creature is there, and somewhere in those woods is the footage of what happened to Eric and Kevin. One day, I'll figure out the truth of it. But until then, stay far, far away from Carlisle's Colonial Park. I've always been attracted to the weird, the strange, the oddities, the macabre. I run a paranormal blog. I've been to every supposed haunted location in my tri-state area. I've poured hours of my life into researching the unexplainable. Hell, I practically live on the paranormal subreddit. Quite recently, someone had reached out to me. They asked me if I was interested in going on an expedition. Dear Mr. Palyor, you were invited to a limited number of seats to join us on an expedition for expedential findings. A surge of rather concrete evidence has recently appeared down in the heart of the Florida Everglade. We're compiling a crack team of paranormal experts. If you're interested, please feel free to email us back. So I did what any paranormal geek would do. I emailed them back as soon as I could. The only thing that left me a bit uneasy was they were very aloof on the description of the said monster we were hunting. Granted, we were heading down to the Everglades, so it could only be one thing. It was the Wolfman of Heatstroke Swamp. Ha, right. Yeah, no, more likely we're looking at a reptilian-like gator man, or the Swamp Ape, aka Florida Bigfoot. 
Here we are three days later and I hopped on the first plane I can get down to Florida. My first thoughts when I stepped off the plane were, oh my god, it is hot. It was spring but it was in the low 90s with a heat index of over 100. Why would anyone want to live like this, especially a cryptid? Thoughts for later times. I grabbed myself an Uber and headed towards the destination of our meetup. When I arrived at our meetup destination, there were three other women and two men. After exchanging familiarities, we realized that the people who had invited us on this trek weren't even with us yet. After about another 10 minutes or so, a small bus pulled up. A couple that had to be in their mid-40s stepped off the bus. The couple introduced themselves as the Millers. They briefed us on what was expected of this trip. And lo and behold, I was right. The Millers told us of a camping site near the Everglades that had been recently closed earlier this year. The bodies of three young men were found strewn around the campsite, miles from each other. The news ruled it out as a group of four had gone camping, and one of them had snapped and killed the other three. Yet, if you read the autopsy report, the examination says it was they were all mauled by an animal. And then in parentheses it says a cougar. And if you interview the locals, they'll all tell you the same thing. It was the swamp ape. After getting a briefing from the Millers, our little band of misfits packed into the bus and we headed towards the camping site. I got this weird feeling in my stomach I couldn't shake as we pulled up to the gravel parking lot in the entrance of the campsite. There was one other vehicle in the parking lot. It was a jeep, to be specific. The entrance to the camp was covered in yellow caution tape. A large burly man with a mustache stood next to the entrance with his arms crossed. His body language was projecting an unapproachable vibe. As our group gathered around him, he spoke up. I presume you are the Millers, and you brought yourself a group of lambs to a slaughter? The whole group gasped and was taken aback by his comment. Dr. Miller quickly took charge of the situation and explained to him that this was a group of colleagues who were all interested in the same thing, finding the truth about what happened here. The burly man rolled his eyes as he put his hand on a knot where all the tape had met in the middle, and within seconds, the entrance to the camping site was now open. Our group filed into the entrance of the campsite one by one. As I passed the burly man, he rolled his eyes at me and said, Don't drink the Kool-Aid! Oh, well, that's great. He thinks we're like a cult or something. Might as well add occult magic to the issues going on at this campground. A group hoofed it for about 25 minutes towards the campsite. Until at one point, Dr. Miller dropped his backpack and said, Aha! We have arrived. Excitedly, Dr. Miller claimed, This is where we're going to make history. It looked like any ordinary campsite to me. We each started to unpack our bags, and we helped set up base camp. At the heart of base camp was a tent full of electronic gizmos and gadgets. The Millers divided us up into pairs of two and had us go off to install trail cams. I got paired up with a young girl in about her early 20s with long brunette hair and big blue eyes named Elaine. Elaine and I headed west. It was our job to install a trail cam about a mile west. The other three groups would do the same in the other directions. We'd all head to the east and then half a tick up installing another camera giving us a full field of vision around us. After we got all our cameras installed, we all met back at the heart of base camp. By the time we all returned, it was getting close to twilight. I helped gather firewood in the meantime, waiting for nightfall to hit. Amongst my hunt, I found something. It had to be something that the police missed when combing the crime scene. It was the shred of a garment or a sleeping bag, and it was bloodstained. As I was lost in thought over this, I heard a scream in the distance. I snapped back to reality and hustled back to base camp. After we all arrived back and did a head count, we realized Elaine was not with the group anymore. Everyone fanned out to look for her except the Millers. Dr. Miller was more interested in watching his camera feed, and his wife claimed she should stay behind in case Elaine returns. The other five of us geared up for the investigation, and we fanned out to look for Elaine and possibly something else. We all kept trying to call her phone, but no one was picking up. Every 15 minutes or so, I'd walkie back to base to see if there was any sign of Elaine. It had been an hour or so, and by now it was pitch black out here. I thought I caught the scent of something in the air. Whatever it was, it smelled terrible, like like rotting vomit. As I kept pushing on, I was dialing Elaine's cell phone for the umpteenth time when I heard something. It was like a, a buzzing noise, kind of like a phone on vibrate, and then I kicked something with my foot. Elaine's cell phone had been laying face down in the sand, and when I was dragging my feet, I happened to knock it face up. What's more concerning was what, what the cell phone was in. It was a humongous footprint. Was somebody fucking with me? Was this just like an elaborate prank? At this point, I was waiting for some asshole to jump out in a gorilla suit and start chasing me. I radioed back to base. The line was dead silent. Shit wasn't making sense, and I needed some goddamn answers. I was back to base in about 20 minutes. I couldn't believe what I fucking saw. The tent that had been receiving all the video feed was trashed. The whole place reeked, and there was somebody sitting on top of somebody by the fire. I shined my light on them and said, Ha, very fucking funny, guys. You got me. The person sitting on top of the other person's chest looked like they were wearing a gorilla suit. Until it turned around. I locked eyes with that fucking thing, and... I about shit myself. I was going into panic. I felt like, like I couldn't breathe. I broke the eye contact with the blink and that's when it let out a roar. <laughs> my eyes widened. My heart skipped a beat. I went right into fight or flight mode. And let me tell you, bitch, I was flying. 
I started running in a strange zigzag pattern diagonally away from it. I was hoping I could confuse it, or shake it, or something. After five minutes of straight sprinting, I ducked behind a tree and clasped my hand over my mouth. I rubbed my temple with my free hand and tried to gather my thoughts. I couldn't I could not grasp this. Like, what the fuck was that? It got Elaine, and whoever else the fuck was still at camp. My mind raced on what to do as I held the stitch in my side. This didn't make any sense. I've researched Bigfoot in the past. They've never been hostile like this. Why would they even let us in here if they knew that was out here? I decided my best bet for survival was if I left right fucking now. I decided the next best move was probably to call 911 and see if I can get some backup here. I pulled my phone out, and wouldn't you know it, dead battery. Fuck, I exclaimed to myself. I killed my battery calling Elaine's phone so many damn times. I came up with a game plan. I needed to go to the police, but I couldn't without proof. They just treat me like the last guy whose friends died up here. I don't even know these fuckers. There's no way I'm going to jail for this shit. I had to do something. So then I made the dumbest decision I could think of on the spot. I'll go back for Elaine's phone. I'll get a picture of this thing, and I'll prove what I saw. So I started heading back the direction I had come. I was as quiet as I could be. I was practically tiptoeing. I ended up back at base camp before anything else. There was a bloody corpse laying next to the flyer. I carefully and stealthily snuck over to it. It, it was Mrs. Miller. As disgraceful as it was, I felt through her pockets looking for her cell phone. Ah, got it. It had been damaged during the attack. The screen was pure white. Donkey fucker! I exclaimed as I threw the phone. It landed next to the tent that Dr. Miller had originally been sitting in when I left the first time. The tent was in shreds, and there was blood everywhere. A pair of broken legs jetted out from underneath the shreds of the tent. I recognized those boots. They were Dr. Miller's. Damn it, that's three. I retraced my steps to the best of my memory and headed towards that footprint that I had found earlier this evening. During this time, I heard another scream echo in the distance. <coughs> Whatever this thing was, it was tearing through us like a bag of chips. After hearing that scream, I picked up my pace, but I also became very paranoid with every step I took. As I made pace in my hike, that pungent odor from before started to slap my nostrils. I stopped dead in my tracks. I hadn't even made it back to the place where I had found the phone when I happened upon not one, but two of these things. They were fighting over a corpse. It was the sickest tug of war you could ever imagine. My brain was overloaded with fear. I slowly began to back away as I realized the fault of my air, thinking that I was going to get a picture of one of these things and survive. Too late. As I backed away, my foot snapped a twig. Both the creatures stopped abruptly and looked straight in my direction. A split second, I pulled my phone out of my pocket and chucked it as hard as I could to the left, and it made a rustle sound as it hit the bush. The skunk apes let out a simultaneous roar. I pressed my back to the closest tree and I slowly slid down. I decided at this point survival was more important than anything else and I decided to wait for my opportunity to escape. I timed each movement with precise caution. I moved a few feet every ten minutes or so. Eventually, I reached the entrance to the campgrounds. I found the outline of our bus sitting lonesome in the moonlight. Of course I didn't have the keys, but I figured I'd just pry my way onto it and then I'd at least spend the night there safe. I didn't get much sleep that night, I think I nodded off maybe once or twice as I sat there paranoid in the back of the bus. Eventually. The sun did come up. That was the longest night of my life. An hour or so went by, and a familiar vehicle pulled up. It was that mustachioed douche, the park ranger who let us in the day before. I never thought I'd be so relieved to see such an asshole. I got out of the bus, and I called out to him. He was shocked to see me. He was heading towards the entrance to the campground, and I begged him not to go in there. He stopped, raised an eyebrow, and then proclaimed, You seen it, didn't you? I quietly nodded. What about the others? Are, are you the only one left? He asked me. I ran my hand over my head and just quietly shook my head no. Well, I take it as you were sleeping in that bus, you don't have the keys, so get in the jeep. I'll give you a ride back to town. Now, I distrusted this asshole, but I was willing to put more faith into him than the thing that tore apart my colleagues last night. I got in the passenger side of his jeep, and we drove away. I was exhausted. I probably passed out within ten minutes of us being in that jeep. I awoke to the slam of a, a car door. I blinked a few times and scanned my surroundings. I had a quick start when I looked over and saw Mr. Mustache leaning against the window of my passenger door. I was confused more than anything because we were surrounded by wilderness and we were in front of the mouth of a cave. Seconds passed and then I realized what was happening. Me and Mr. Mustache locked eyes as a dastardly grin creeped across his face. He went to open the door, but I slammed the lock down with my fist. He flashed a gun and cocked his head at me. He notioned for me to get out of the jeep. I obliged begrudgingly. I asked him in a loud voice, What the hell do you think you're doing? Slowly pressed his hands to his lips and made a shh. Angry and confused, I asked him, What the hell do you mean? He replied in a southern hiss, Well, boy, this is it. This is where they nest. You're at the entrance to the den of the skunk apes. My mind started to race. I was trying to find a way out of what he was about to do to me here. We shared a few seconds of silence and then he piped back up. I can't let you leave after what you done did seen. And I can't keep having people survive and be arrested for murdering their friends. It's going to start to look suspicious. 
I dropped to my knees in a sign of false defeat. Shakingly, I clenched two fists of dirt. He cleared his throat and then said, Enough of that. Get back up. We're heading inside there. He pointed a gun at my head, took off the safety, and said, Move. Now his back was to the cave, so I widened my eyes and I said in a shaky voice, Look behind you. I turned around quickly and worried. I waited for him to turn back angrily. I stood up quickly and flung both handfuls of dirt into his face. Direct hit, I got him in the eyes, and then he screamed. You asshole! I swiftly kicked him in the balls after that. I grabbed his gun, and I grabbed the jeep keys. After checking to make sure the safety was still off, I put a bullet through his knee. Afterwards, I frantically jumped into the jeep, I turned it on, and I hauled ass while leaving my hand on the horn. I saw it in my rear view. Multiple of those things came out of the mouth of the cave and surrounded him as he laid in pain, grasping his knee. I don't mess with the paranormal anymore. I don't go outside. I don't go near the woods. I feel like sometimes, if I close my eyes and sit in silence, I can still hear the powerful screech of the skunk ape. Hurry up. Hurry up. Get your backpack. Come on. Shh, dude, I'm going. Okay, I'm just saying, be quick, I don't want to get caught again. Well look, I can't just send me through the gate like you do. I know, it's just, my parents will kill me if I get caught here again. Ugh, then uh, why are we here? You know why we're here. We're not gonna get YouTube famous off of pulling chairs along the floor with a fishing line. There's no way they can tell it's fishing line, dude. Dude, they could totally tell that was fishing line. <sighs> Whatever, it's not like your orbs in the graveyard video was that much better. I know. Why do you think we're here tonight? We're gonna get a real ghost on tape. You're wrong, dude. The cemetery is too cliche to actually see ghosts. So you probably wonder what's going on here, but this is a conversation I recorded earlier in the evening between me and my best friend, Jack. We're aspiring ghost hunters, and we're hoping to become famous on YouTube for our paranormal findings. We're about to jump back into it here, but just so you know, I had also invited two of my neighbors to join us. So going forward in this recording, you'll hear me, Daryl, my best friend, Jack, uh, the two neighbor kids I invited, who is Ross, and his younger brother, Landon. Ugh, oh, this gate, it's squeezing my thickness. <laughs> the gate squeezed a fart out of me. <coughs> Jesus, Jack, you're gonna kill the Wasimis. Yeah, stop it, Jack, you're killing me. It smells like Monster Jam 2008. Landon, focus. Not everything's about monster trucks, okay, Chief? Sorry, guys, it's not his fault, it's just... I showed him this monster truck hentai last weekend, and he just won't stop talking about it. Ugh, why did you invite them? They're so not Ice Ice Baby cool, man. Okay, look, I'm sorry. They read the entire Goosebumps collection. I figured they were brave enough to come to the graveyard with us, okay? I guess. I mean, if they got past Chicken Chicken, then they're brave enough to be here. I think we should all form a club. We can be the Chicken Chicken Club. Ah, uh, goddammit, Landon, I told you six times already. Chickens aren't brave. If anything, we're the Assassin's Creed Kings. Uh -huh. Ugh, finally. That gate was squeezing my biscuits. Okay, Landon, hold your breath and come through next. That way we can worry for Ross to come through last, because Jack took a bit to get through, and I don't want to be here all night. So after much distress and many farts, we finally made it into the graveyard as a group of four. We were there hunting the supposed ghost of Hillside Fields, which walked the cemetery every night after midnight. What we ended up finding was much, much scarier. Okay, everybody, flashlights out. I got mine, guys. Look, if I put it in my sleeve, it looks like it's an assassin's lightsaber. Shut up, Wasimi, before I shove that flashlight up your butt. <sighs> you guys are going to be the death of me. That's ironic, because we're in a cemetery. Shut up, Landon. <coughs> Jack, if you keep farting, you're going to scare the ghost away. No, I'm not. Shut up, Daryl. I can't help that Mama's enchiladas and taco salad made a young boy's butthole bark. Right, well, according to legend, if we're going to see any ghosts tonight, we need to be in the center of the graveyard before midnight. Listen, guys, no one better try to pull any funny business and scare me. Not that I'd get scared. I am an Assassin's Creed king. You know, I am the leader of that group. But still, don't try any funny business. I'm walking ahead now and ignoring you all. It wasn't until we got to the center of the graveyard where all the funny business actually started. There was something in the center of the graveyard that no one was expecting to see that night. I wish we had known. Okay now, according to legend, you can see three different types of ghosts depending on the night and conditions of the weather. <laughs> Make that four. 
Oh my gosh, your butt sounds like one of those car alarms that go off when a monster truck crushes them. It's not just that, Landon. It smells like it, too. Anyway, the most common sighting of ghosts here is the ghost of the original Grave Digger. Grave Digger is my favorite monster truck. <laughs> you don't say, Landon. Mine's Los Fartos. Very funny, Jack. All right, guys, follow me. Let's keep it moving. We're going to start heading. What? Guys, guys, where'd Daryl go? He better not be trying to scare me. I don't know. He was right there a second ago. Yeah, it's like he vanished in the thin air like one of my many farts. <sighs> Ow, hey, buttholes, I'm down here. Where? I don't see you. Look closely in front of you. I fell in this hole. That's not a hole, Daryl. That's an open grave. Oh, that would explain this open coffin. And the skeleton. <laughs> Daryl, stop screaming like a girl. I'll pull you out, dingus. Here, just give me your hand, Daryl. Beavis, butthead. Grab my shirt and pull on me, you assimies. <laughs> you sick asshole. Come on, Jack. My mouth was open. <laughs> Double kill, losers. Guys, 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 guys. Shut up. Get down right now. Is that any way to say thanks to your homie who just saved you? Dude, shut up. We're not alone anymore. There's someone right over there. <laughs> About 25 feet away from us, in the silhouette of the moonlight, there were two figures standing around a grave. So I may have also forgot to mention that the only reason you're hearing all this and not seeing it is because I forgot to take the lens off my dad's camcorder. Guys, who would be in the cemetery after midnight? Teens, maybe? Like, maybe goths or something? I'm not I'm not sure, Landon. Guys, be quiet. Listen to what they're saying. It wasn't here either. I know, and I wasted so much energy digging this one up. I know, we shouldn't waste a meal. It's not what I wanted to eat tonight, but I guess this'll do. Well, maybe if we're lucky, we'll bump into that sweet, succulent scent that's floating around the air tonight. Either way, I'm hungry. I'm so tired of eating this rotten flesh. As am I, but you know the ghoul rules. Yeah, yeah, you know, gotta remind me again. <sighs> Guys, I think I heard them call themselves ghouls. Oh, you did, Ross. I heard it too. Guys, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, right, they're just some punk teenagers drinking in the graveyard. Ghouls, smoles. They can eat my butt. <laughs> Jack, that fart was really loud. Hey, did you hear that? Yes, I did hear that. It came from that direction right over there. Teeth police guys, they're pointing right at us. Okay guys, we need to go, like right now. <laughs> yeah, you heard it right, genuine ghouls. So from here I've cut the wind audio of us running across the graveyard back to the gate. The ghouls did pursue us. Okay, guys, here's the deal. Throw your backpacks over the gate. Land in your tiniest. You go first. All right, now me? Huh? All right, Ross, you gotta be quick, man. Suck it in. I'm trying, but I'm not that skinny. Well, think them thoughts hard, but because they're coming. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, Jack, push on his back, and me and Landon will pull on his arms. Pull. <sighs> pull. Oh, you're killing me. <sniffs> oh, sick, dude. Oh, please, Jack. You earned that one. All right, Jack, enough dilly-dallying. Get through that gate. Come on, they're coming. They're right behind you. Oh, no. They're getting away. I was right. The scent that's been dancing around our nostrils all night has been coming from them. Okay, Landon, Ross, grab his arms. I'm going to pull on his collar. Hurry, guys. Pull. It's him. That's the one we want. Guys, hurry. They have my ankles. Pull with Siamese. Pull. Try as you might, children. This one will not elude our grasp. We didn't get Jack out of the graveyard. We tugged with all our might, but we couldn't pull him out. The ghouls overpowered us and pulled him right back through the gate to their side. He put his hand out and screamed. They started eating him right there. They liked the way he smelled, which I guess makes sense because they eat rotten flesh, which stinks, and he was always farting. So, wherever you may be now, this one goes out to you, Jack. <laughs> Well, hello, kitties. I hope that you all enjoyed the four creepy cryptid encounter stories tonight. Boy, 
that last story really went out with a bang. <laughs> Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to check out the guest narrators, as their information will be in the description box down below. Have a good night.